Good evening. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. Um, just to explain a little bit about where we are, where did we come from, what are we trying to do. Approximately three years ago, um, there was a concerted effort in the community to talk more about substance abuse, alcoholism, drugs, prescription drugs. And we as a school district embraced that. And we partnered with the Central Nautilus Valley Regional Action Council to find out what's been happening and what happens with our young adults in our community. And we've had a series of workshops over the last couple of years to raise awareness. There have been a lot of groups in the community that have started up for prevention, for intervention, that have helped people in the community, and we're very happy about that. But last spring, we took the step forward where students in grades 6 through 12 at Terrell and Wilka High School took this attitudes and behavior survey. I'm sure everybody heard about it. And we purposely did it in the spring to find out what's going on and what's happening. The results were shared with me over the summer. And last Friday, a group of students from Terrell Middle School and Wilka High School helped analyze those survey results. And you can see the web here. Um, some of the things they're going to explain to you tonight with Mr. Duffy. But what we're excited about is that in order to solve this problem, and let me just say this, I think Wolcott is a very caring community. I've been in a lot of districts. I've never seen one so much volunteerism, community service, a caring atmosphere. But we suffer from an addiction that suburban America has, and that's an increase in substitute and alcohol abuse. It's not a Wolcott problem. It's not because of Wolcott. However, we have it in Wolcott. And I think instead of putting our heads in the scene and not addressing it, because over the last year we've had students, former students who have died from it, we're going to address it head on. And what I'm excited about tonight is that the students are going to help us figure out what's going on. So today you're going to be shared with the results, figure out where we're going to go. But today is not the end, it is the beginning. It is the start of a journey to figure out how we're going to change this community and how we're going to change the culture. And it's not going to happen today or tomorrow or next week. It's going to take years, probably going to take a decade, believe it or not, to change the community to get awareness about substance abuse, how we can help our young people adapt, how we can make them effective citizens in the 21st century global economy, how we can make them successful and feel good about themselves. So I'm very, very excited today. Um, I want to welcome Mr. Duffy, who's done a, this all over the country. Um, he'll be speaking to you in a minute. But before I do that, I want to introduce Jen DeWitt. She's the Executive Director of the uh, Central Nautilus Valley Regional Action Council. And she's really the one who has spearheaded this in the community and the surrounding towns. And we are fortunate to have her. I was able to step in for a little while on Friday, see what she did with the students, and it was unbelievable. So without any further ado, Ms. DeWitt. big mouth, so I don't think I need to use the microphone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. I know um, these uh, young people in the front here heard me yelling and shouting and, and giving them all sorts of instructions on Friday. I won't do that today, I promise. Yes, we did that. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Jennifer DeWitt, and I'm the Executive Director of the Central Naugatuck Valley Regional Action Council. We're one of 13 partnership regional action councils across the state. Um, that together work to prevent substance abuse and other harmful behaviors. And one of the ways that I personally think um, is really important to preventing substance abuse is by building assets. And so you're going to learn a lot tonight from your students and from Mr. Duffy about what assets are and how we build them in young people. And your kids are going to talk to you specifically about what they've learned about the assets and how they work here in Wolkett. They're going to share with you the strengths that they've identified around the asset framework and the areas of assets that they're really concerned about and that they think is going to take a collective effort to improve upon. So um, before I give you all of our thanks and introduce you to our young people, I just want to draw your attention to this beautiful web that we have on the wall. It's called the Asset Web. And your students actually worked on Friday in a youth retreat all day long. They worked really, really hard, probably harder than some of them have worked in a full academic day, but there was chocolate and stuff to keep them motivated. <laughs> and um, they identified all of the strengths that they see happening in their community and in their school and in their homes 
around these asset areas. So I encourage you before the evening's over um, to just stop by and take a look at the assets. And these are all things that your students identified that are going really well for young people in Wolcott. Because before we talk about the problems and the things that need to change and fix and improve, we need to acknowledge the things that are going well already. Um, and this web is based on an exercise that we do in the retreat where um, we use this Ethiopian proverb that says, when all the spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. And so the kids really understood that and understood um, this framework and, and how it relates to the things that we're trying to do here. So as Mr. McCary said, um, this is the beginning. This is not the end. Okay, and I want you to be cognizant of that and to remember that throughout the evening. Um, so again, thanks to Superintendent McCary, because without the support of your chief elected officials, none of this work happens. It needs to be grassroots and ground up, but it also needs to be top-down leadership supported. And that's one of the things that you have going really well for you here in Wolcott. Tonight you have your chief of police here with you as well, Chief Stevens. You also um, have regards sent by your mayor, Mayor Dunn. Um, and so your top three uh, gentlemen in the community are here, either physically or in other ways in support of this evening. And that's an excellent starting point for your young people. Um, I'd also like to thank and acknowledge all of the parents that are in uh, the audience tonight because I've talked to a number of you who said, no, I don't have any kids here this evening, but I'm a parent in this community. And that's really important to be here, whether or not you have kids here who are speaking this evening, but just because you're concerned. So I acknowledge you, and I'm grateful that you're here in the audience. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, teachers in this district, and especially um, Ms. Jill Fontanella and Mr. Tony Cinchetti, um, social workers at our schools who have really helped and been an integral part of coordinating the youth retreat in this evening's rollout, and even the data collection that occurred in your schools in the spring. I'd also like to acknowledge older and younger siblings, some of whom took messages for and supported their siblings in being here this evening, um, because they're important asset builders too. I'd like to thank your business leaders and our media partners. I'd like to give a really big shout out to Drew Larson and Jim Shannon of the Republican American who came and spent a really long time with the kids on Friday during their retreat, learning exactly what it is that they were going through listening to them, taking really great pictures, and writing an excellent article about the work that everyone here did on Friday. So we really owe them um, some support for supporting us and getting you here this evening. Um, everyone who has the opportunity to cross the path of a young person is an asset builder. If you pass a kid and you don't smile at them, look them in the eye, acknowledge them, or ask them their name, you should. So I want to make sure that all of our community sectors are involved in asset building this evening. I'd like to acknowledge our faith-based leaders because they're asset builders. I'd like to acknowledge our neighbors because they're asset builders. I'd like to acknowledge our medical and um, health care partners, our social service agencies, and our youth serving agencies. And I know that Wolcott has a lot of good things going on after school. I've heard it from your students, and I know from people who live in this community. Um, I'd also like to thank a few of our um, special groups that work in this community that I know are tremendous support to many people, and those groups are CASA and Crossroads. Um, as Mr. McCary said, there has been a concerted effort over the past few years specifically to address substance abuse concerns in the community, and Wilkett is a great example of what happens when caring people come together to do just that. So you have that in your corner as well. With that, I'd like to give you a few logistics and then introduce you to our young people this evening. Um, cell phones, if they're not already, please silence them completely. Even a vibrating cell phone is distracting, and we want to give Tim and the kids our full attention this evening. The sign-in sheet at the front is just to let us know you were here, and if you don't have a packet, please grab one on your way out. The bathrooms are directly out this door to the left, and then straight in front of you, men's room and ladies' room. And um, just so that you know also, this presentation is being videotaped tonight for parents and other families who are not able to be here. When it comes to the question and answers portion of the evening, we'll turn the videotape off so that you can feel comfortable asking whatever you're concerned about without worry about what the answer might be or that someone might hold back sharing their honest opinion with you. Um, the videotape is going to be posted on the district website um, because I already know there were a few students and parents who couldn't be here this evening that I spoke with on the phone this afternoon and they're really looking forward to seeing and hearing what's shared tonight. So please tell someone who couldn't be here that they can find this presentation and view it later on. So 
As Mr. McCary said, change is not the sole responsibility of the school system. It's not the sole responsibility of our chief elected officials. It starts right here. It starts with you, and it starts with me. Um, I had two opportunities, one this summer and one just a few weeks ago, that I'd like to share with you briefly. One was I went to uh, my first ever youth summer camp. It was called Youth to Youth International, and it was actually a life-changing experience for me. Um, and the Youth to Youth International camp uh, promotes assets, positive youth development, and they promote substance abuse prevention. So they have this great dual purpose, which is perfect for what I do. Uh, so I went and I got to go as an adult staff and learn their framework and uh, met with over 300 young people from all over New England. And at the end of the week, I realized something really important, that if every single adult in every single town cares about young people, if every single young person goes home at night and knows that they're loved and feels safe and feels cared about when they go to bed, every single kid will have a brighter future. And it was kind of a vision that struck me that actually made me feel really emotional and brought tears to my eyes because I thought, it's not like that. Every kid is not loved and every kid does not feel safe. And our data tells us that. We know that. There are kids that don't feel like they can talk to their moms and their dads and the people who love them most about the things that are, matter to them most. And that's really scary. So I want you to go with that vision about what this perfect place would look like if every single kid felt loved and cared about and safe. I want you to leave this evening with that vision in your mind. The second thing I want to tell you about is a few weeks ago I took a trip to a tiny little place in northern Maine called Vinyl Haven. Any of you ever heard of it? Yeah, I didn't hear of it either. They said it's like the vineyard, but not touristy. So um, there's a lot of lobster fishing, and it's a very small community. It's a little island. It's about five and a half hours north, and then it's about an hour and a half out to sea, and then there you are in Vinyl Haven. And Vinyl Haven has about 1,500 residents year-round. And every single person waves to every single person every time they drive by them in the car or walk by them on the street. And I'm, you know, kind of like an uptight New Englander, and I was like, why are these people friendly? God. <laughs> but I thought, that's so nice. Everybody waves to everybody. Everybody acknowledges everybody. Everybody's just like, hey, how you doing? That's the other piece I want you to leave here with. Think about just waving to it, just connecting to, with just a wave, every single person in your community. What a united, special place Wolke would be. Imagine if people were like, everyone in Wolke waves. <laughs> I, but it's possible because it happens. It happens on Vinyl Haven. Things like that happen at Youth to Youth Conference. So they can happen here. I know they can because I've seen them work. <coughs> Okay, so those are the two things that I want you to be here with this evening. With that, I'd like to tell you about some really amazing kids. I'm just going to um, list the 38 young people who participated in your youth retreat on Friday. And if, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you're standing here, or if you're sitting here, I should say, and you hear your name called, please just stand up and stay standing until I get to the end of the list. And I'm going to apologize in advance if I make any mistakes on anyone's names, okay? So just stand up if you hear your name on call. They just want you guys to know who worked on what you're getting here this evening. So um, at our Wolfwood Youth Retreat, high school and middle school students were Hannah um, Fratelli, Andrew Thompson, Carmeli Shastri, Ethan Pernell, Emily Janerare, Ashley Fontaine, Isabella Ingles. Madison Forrest, Chris Jones, Adam Cater, Christina Santa Lucia, Samantha Chassi, Scott Saucier, Emily Green, Alex Gutierre, Christina Onofrio, Drew McQueenie, Gianna Samuel, Nick Charlo, Matt Carnier, Justin Sasserchik, Cassandra Spray. Brett Brennan, Jania Sineski, Thomas Burns, Cheyenne Goodfield, Tom Von Visudo, Jenny Leonard, David Morsiri, Kaylee Sheldon, Erica Fizzoli, Emily Green, Samantha Ackers, Marissa Rodriguez, 
Angelo Naples, Lauren Romeo, Nick Kumo, and last but not least, Hayden Crump. So these are some of the wonderful, wonderful students we have in Wilkit um, that you should make a point to talk to before the end of this evening. They've got some really important things to share with you, ideas about how to improve their community, make it a great place. I'd like to just last uh, we acknowledge the help of my staff, volunteers, and interns with the Central Naugatuck Valley Regional Action Council, who volunteered to work with these kids on Friday, as well as Jill Fontanelle and Tony Cinchetti and myself. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge the administration, both at the high school and the middle school, for their support in getting these kids out of classes for the day to work on this. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce to you our wonderful presenter with our students this evening. His name is Tim Duffy, and, and he and I did the math and found out that we've only been working together for two years, but so it feels kind of like 20, which I don't know what that says, but, um, but we've done, what it says is that we've done a lot of really cool things in two years, and we're like, only two years? Wow, we're, we're pretty good. So, um, but seriously, this work is, you get so passionate about it that you just can't slow down. And Tim is not from here, but he spent so much time here in this part of Connecticut and in Connecticut in general, it feels like he's really right next door to me. And I know that he and his wife are only a phone call away. So without further ado, um, he has updated his bio for me, and I have this shiny new bio. I like the old one. It was, it was bigger and, and glossier and more sparkly, but we'll, we'll go with the watered-down version. So he's a, a training specialist, a safe and supported schools, technical assistance center, training manager, search institute. He's wonderful in a lot of different ways. He has professional experience as a school counselor and director of guidance. He has extensive experience with peer helping and student assistance programs. For the past 15 years, Tim's professional experience has been rooted in positive youth development, particularly the work of the search institute and their developmental assets framework. He manages the North American training team for Search Institute and has extensive speaking and training experience in both domestic and international settings. He also serves as training specialist for the Safe and Supported Schools Technical Assistance or Center in Washington, D.C. His business is the primary partner of the center that coordinates webinars, face-to-face -face training events, and training design development for the SSSTA grantees in 11 participating states and non-participating schools nationwide. He is the father of three adult children. He lives in Standish, Maine with his business partner and wife of 36 years, Donna, who's also here with him this evening. And he also has one cat with um, evident royalty bloodlines, and I just found out that my cat is related to his. So <laughs> without further ado, would you please help me welcome Mr. Tim Duffy. Expectation was set about behavior. You are welcomed in. 
um, and you were identified uh, by your behaviors. So uh, let's keep that in mind as we think about our work together this evening. So um, I, I bring greetings to you from two states, from Minnesota, which is where Search Institute is located, and from Maine, which is where Donna and I live. Um, and very proud to be with you tonight to share with you some information and to tell you that you're doing a great job already. Because most people who administer these kinds of surveys ask the students in their midst about their life experience, and then a massive report comes back and about six or eight adults sit together in a boardroom somewhere and talk about what they're going to do with those results. You, in your wisdom, and under the leadership of the Regional Action Council, are taking a different path already. And a part of that path was last Friday when those 38 young people came together and they looked at the data themselves first and made sense of it for them. They'll talk with you about that, not all 38, but a good contingent of them tonight. Um, and I believe that you're setting yourself on an excellent path to do both of that. Excellent path to do something very important with that information um, because you've already broke the mold about how you're going about doing this work and that's critical. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the, the foundation, the, where this information comes from. Um, you're going to get a quick flyover of information about developmental assets this evening. If you just don't have time to do a lab, we're going to talk to you about the data results mostly. But I do want you to know enough about the assets to be uh, dangerous, if you will. All right? So we'll tell you a little bit about them um, so that you know from whence they come. The three sources for the things that we asked our young people about, the developmental assets, are from literature and science, mid social science, that talks about what are the things that prevent risky behavior. Now, some risk is good risk to take. We, we push our boundaries and try something new. That's an okay thing we want for our young people. But there are some risks that jeopardize their health that we don't want them to take. And so, can you call one point two or come down to the athletic office, please? So we looked at the research about what are the things that most protect our young from that kind of behavior. Second thing is, does it build resiliency? Resiliency is an engineering term that's been applied to the human condition that talks about the ability to bounce back. So the best example I always think of, at least, is a retractable pen, which if you take that string out and you compress it like that, when you let go, what's it going to do? It's going to immediately spring back to its original shape. Well, we humans are like that, resiliency researchers tell us, and that is that we have a lot of innate capacity, except under the most extreme duress, to be able to do that, to bounce back. And so we looked at the conditions in the science that say, what, what does it take to do that? And then we wanted to find out how present those things are in young people's lives. And then the third is, does it promote positive youth development? So it's not enough that we're, we're stopping bad things from happening. We want kids to be set on positive direct trajectories in their lives. And so the balance of those things, the stopping the negative things from happening in their lives to the degree we can, and enhancing the positives are exactly what we're looking for, that balance point. And that's what we asked about in the survey that we administered and that you'll hear about this evening. I want to share these couple of points, um, and then I'm going to call our students up front. These few points about this work, and some of these have been touched upon already. This is not, we didn't do the survey, now we're going to get together tonight and talk about it and then go there. We've done that now. Let's set that aside and let's move on to something else. This is really a beginning. The beginning of a lot of dialogue that I believe is important to have as a community about the kinds of items we can talk about and start the conversation about tonight. You've done this already too, which is you've honored the students by helping, allowing them the opportunity to participate. They have some great ideas. I've met those that are here this evening. I'm very impressed um, by them and their interest in this work. And together, what we want to do tonight is expand the network from them to also many of you as adults and to think about how do we move from here as a community together to do something. And this point is an important one. I believe that just from this one administration of a survey instrument last spring, you've got five to ten years of response time. You've got things you'll want to take on, things you'll want to tackle, um, and that you've got, you know, you've got time. And it will take that time to make the kinds of changes you want as a community, I'm sure. And this is another important one. There are far too many times when data like this comes into a community and then blame starts being assigned. Well, if only so-and-so would do this, if only so-and-so, oftentimes it's parents is one of the first places things get pointed to. Or it could be the school, or it could be law enforcement, or it could be, you know, somebody's always going to get blamed. And I don't know about you, but somewhere along the way growing up, somebody once told me, be careful when you do this. Anybody know the rest of that one? 
Because when you do, three fingers point right back at you, you better be willing to stand up for your responsibility. So I guess that's, that's a request I have of you tonight, which is that you take this information in, and rather than finding some place to place blame for the things you don't like in what you see, that we come together around ways in which we can move forward to make changes in that. And I think that's what your young people are asking for as well. And then finally, before bringing young people up, let me just show you this slide and talk about it quickly. Um, I am going to pull out my phone, but not to take calls, but to check time. So I'm going to do that in a moment. Um, but here's the, the kinds of culture shifts that we at Search Institute believe are important to make in, in communities. The first is that we're moving away from a focus on fixing problems in young people's lives to, to focusing on their strengths, to believing that they have those strengths, to really trying to call them out and to bring them forward. And you've got youth leaders in our midst tonight that exhibit that. Away from programs toward relationships, and I'm not dissing relationships, I mean programs, when I say that. Programs are good things for kids, but the research has been done about the programs that are most successful in terms of being preventative around uh, keeping young people from engaging in those unnecessary, unhealthy risk behaviors. They're steeped in relationships. That's what the common core of those are. So how do we focus our emphasis on the relationships that matter so much and enhance those to become the community that waves? Um, how do we move away from doing for young people to doing with them as equal partners, adults and youth together? Again, I think you've set the stage for that very well. And how do we move away from talking about some young people, those at risk, those who are in trouble with the law, whatever, to really making sure that we're concerned about the best for all young people? And that's the directions that we believe are, are essential to have. So um, we want to introduce you a little bit to the information around uh, that comes from the survey, but first by looking at a little quiz that we gave you in your packets. So those of you students who are going to be a part of the panel, we want to come up to the chairs now. And then if uh, Samantha and Emily would want to step up in order to take on the quiz. My name is Emily Green. And I'm Samantha Actors, and I'm in seventh grade. I'm in eleventh grade. Carroll Middle School at Wilkett High School students in grades seven through twelve took the Search Institute Profiles of the Young Student Life Attitudes and Behavior Survey in March and April 2012. The 1,194 young people reported on aspects of their lives. If they found caring people in their schools and neighborhoods what types of activities they were involved in, and how they viewed their future, among other things. What did these young people in your community tell us? Make your best guesses to the following questions. What percent of young people sur surveyed report having at least three adults in their lives other than their parents who give them lots of support? A, 25%, B, 52%, C, 76%, D, 90%. Okay, what do you guys think? B, 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 What percentage of youth survey feel that adults in the community value them? A, 27%, B, 37%, C, 59%, or D, 77%? C, 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 C. The correct answer is A, 27%. What percentage of young people survey believe that their parents and other adults
correct answer is D, 67%. What percentage of young people surveyed are motivated to do well in school? What percentage, what percentage said that they accept and take personal responsibility? The correct answer is C, 73%. What percentage of young people serving report reg oh wait, I'm on the wrong number, sorry. What percentage of young people serving report resident ne native peer, peer, peer pressure in dangerous situations? D. 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 D.
Um, let me just point out that the first ones that will be talked about are external assets. They're on the screen now and are identified in an executive summary that you have in your packet on page 1.3. So if you look at that page, you'll see this as students give you a little bit of an introduction to what these assets are about. The first four relate to things that are in the life experience, in the environment around young people as they grow up. That's why we call them external assets, the things out there around them. And so let's find out a little bit more about each of those, starting with the first one that Samantha is going to tell us about. Yes, you may.
thing I want to say is that you may have seen some numbers in these first four that you're not real happy with seeing. One of the things I'd like you to do as we go through these is to begin to absorb the numbers, take them in, see the areas in which you feel pretty happy about where those numbers might be, even though they might be higher, and some of those that are of concern to you. The other thing I'm going to ask you to do as we go through this evening is to think, I'm going to invite you to use the word influencer to think about this person, but I want you to think this evening as we look at this information about someone in your own growing up years. If you're a teenager here tonight, I want you to think about somebody who's in your life now. If you're older than that, I want you to reflect back to the age of these young people, middle school and high school students. Think about when you were that age and who was there for you that was making a positive, significant difference in your life and what they were like. And as we go through this list of items, Make at least a mental note, if not a physical one, on your paper about the things that they built for you. So an example for me was my Uncle Herb, who placed me in a canoe for the first time. I remember being slightly terrified. I grew up in North Dakota. We were on the Missouri River. It's pretty turbulent where I grew up. Um, but this was a, a, a canoeing adventure. I was excited and nervous both. We spent seven hours on the river, and I learned how to paddle a canoe, how to steer a canoe, how to get in and out of a canoe without getting <laughs> drenched. Um, a host of things I learned that day, but what I remember most of all was that for seven hours I had undivided attention from a caring principled adult in my life who was concerned about what I was doing as about a seventh grader, if I remember correctly. And there were a lot of open-ended questions that were asked, most of them about my future. So to me, it was clear that this man cared about who I was. So I want you to think about those kind of people in your life and how they may have embodied at least some elements of this information that we're talking about tonight. Because though they didn't have the language, many of them knew exactly how to be an asset builder in your life. One more thing I want to do before we go to the next four asset categories is to share with you an example about the so what of this. So how do people take this set of ideas and apply it? in their own settings. And so, Chief, you might appreciate this story. This comes from uh, Richmond, British Columbia. It's a suburb of Vancouver, where their equivalent of their chief of police, which is a, I think they're called a superintendent of the RCMP, um, got onto the idea of asset building. And he and his force started to issue positive tickets. So when they're on the street and they see a kid whose bike is licensed, and he is wearing a helmet and he stops when he's supposed to and uh, yields pedestrians or whatever the case might be. They put the blue lights on, they pull over and stop, and as soon as they resuscitate the kid, <laughs> they give him a positive ticket and say, young man, I just want to tell you that I, see, I, see, I saw that you were doing exactly what we want young people to be doing in our community. Congratulations, here's a positive ticket. Usually has, uh, well, they're in Canada, so one of the big things people are after is ice time. Uh, it might be some ice time to go skating, or it might be a, a, an ice cream cone, it might be something in the community. So it's, it brings in the community uh, web and network as well to the effort. That effort has grown and spread across the country in a number of different ways in which folks are using that idea of catching kids doing right and acknowledging that. Now, many of you in this room are not in law enforcement, but to at least the one who is, I would say, the other thing to pay attention to is what that does about building relationship and connection and a different image about what law enforcement is about and how they connect to young people than what is often the case. So there's lots of good in that and lots of possibilities, but that's just one example of how this information is applied out there in the real world. Okay, we have four more categories of assets that do have to do more with the what's in here what's inside of us as we grow up, the internal compasses and values that guide our thinking. And so we'll start to hear about those now. First of all, from Ethan. The, the uh, first category of internal assets is commitment to learning. The, uh, definition here is young people need a sense of the lasting importance of learning and belief in their own abilities. And the five assets in this category are achievement motivation, school engagement, homework, bonding to school, and reading for pleasure. Thank you, Ethan. And for the next category is Lauren. Hi, my name is Lauren, and I'm going to be talking to you about positive values. 
um, positive values are strong guiding values or principles that help students make healthy life choices. This icon is associated with the color orange and a compass. One asset that, that is a strength in this category is integrity, and it means that the young person stands up for his or her beliefs. Um, and 75% of students said they do this, and that was pretty good. Um, but one asset that needs improvement is restraint, and that means the, um, the young person believes that the resistance of sex, drugs, and alcohol is important. Only 43% of students agreed with, it, with restraint, and the other 67% thought that this was acceptable for their age. Um, so I think that both of these could be worked on to be made better. And yeah, thank you. Great. And Alex? Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Gauthier, and I am here to talk about social competencies, which are represented by a purple smiley face. Social competencies are a group of assets that allow young people to benefit from having skills and abilities that equip them to make positive choices, to build relationships, and to deal with difficult situations. Our community has done a good job instilling interpersonal confidence into the lives of the youth. The majority of students surveyed said that they do have the empathy, sensitivity, and friendship skills to make and maintain strong relationships in their lives. While it was great to see that our community as this important asset, I wish we could improve upon our planning and decision making. Only 39% of students said that they know how to plan ahead and make choices. I believe that this is an asset that should be worked on in our community because planning is an asset that is necessary not only in, every, in nearly every workplace, but also to complete tasks in everyday life. I believe that long-term projects, whether in the community or school, may be a way to teach the youth their interpersonal confidence and that we should incorporate these projects into the lives of students at a young age. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And next is Christina. Hi, I'm Christina Goffrio, and I'm a junior at Wolka High School. And I have the category Positive Identity, um, which includes assets 37 through 40, which are personal power, self-esteem, sense of purpose, and positive view of personal future. Um, the best asset in this category I thought was number 40, um, which is the positive view of personal future because 80% of the students agreed with this statement and that was the highest percent rating out of all the assets, which is really good. And um, number 37, personal power, is one I wish could be a little better because I think it's more important, uh, it's important that more students feel more confident in themselves and in their own ability to make themselves and their lives great. Everyone has the power to decide what they want to do with their own lives, and this message needs to be spread in order to help the young people and will get reach their dreams. They control themselves and should not fall under fear, peer pressure to do something that they don't want to do, and I would like to see this asset improved because, because it is beneficial for everyone, everyone's lives in the end. wanted to take an approach that says that we're about trying to build young people up and find opportunities 
and create additional opportunities for them to do good things as opposed to getting into those that they didn't want them to be in. A part of how they went about doing that is they added young people to the steering committee that met annually to set the direction. And those young people were on work teams that helped things to happen in that community month after month after month as they tried to make a difference for life to the, everyone who lived in those communities. Well, one particular year that I was there, I remember about halfway through the day that we had, um, we started to talk about where we should go in the coming year. Their number on planning decision making, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was not one of their shining points. And so the adults in the group started to talk about, we need to do more around planning and decision making. It's a real issue for our kids. Look at the numbers. To which this young man, I think a sophomore in high school, if I remember correctly, kind of timidly raised his hands, hand and said, yeah, may I say something? And I said, sure, what's on your mind? And he said, well, I just, I just need to tell you that starting in grade four, we're taught decision-making skills in this class. In grade five, we're taught decision-making skills in this class. And he went all the way through to his sophomore year um, and talked about where they're taught decision-making skills in that, in that year. And then he said, you know what we are never going to know? Some of these guys might have an opportunity to do much of that. So he said, what I would ask, instead of teaching us again about what it, it, the skills to plan, can we have some opportunities to actually do that in a way that makes a difference in our community? It direct, redirected the entire conversation of that day. Their action plan for the coming year was one that embodied youth empowerment. Uh, the young people were even more involved in what happened in that community. They had great plans about things they could do. And they worked really hard to make sure that, that what young people did that was right got as much attention in that community as when something went awry and somebody made a mistake. Those are some ways in which that worked. The other story I want to share, I have to share with you before I go on, because this is my favorite asset building story. So I could probably stop right there now, and Jen could stand up and finish this, because she's heard me tell the story probably so many times. It's my favorite, Tim. Tell it's, it again. It's, um, it's story time, Jen. Um, so the, the story comes from uh, Georgetown, Texas, and it's about a very forward-thinking middle school principal who came to a national conference about this set of ideas in November of one year, and went back really on fire about the set of ideas. And he thought, we can do something with this in our school. And so he thought about it. And after the holidays, after the midwinter break in that school system, the first day back was a staff day. The night before, he and his wife stayed up late into the hour, hours of that night, writing on a single piece of 8 by 11 paper and one name of each of the 850 student names in that school. And then they posted those names on the back wall of the cafeteria where all good staff development happens in schools. <laughs> so this faculty came in, he explained about these set of ideas, and he said to his staff, he said, now, how do you think we're doing on building this? And they said, well, you know, this is a, this is a great set of ideas. It really makes sense to us. Um, and some of the staff said, you know what, I think we're doing a pretty good job of this already. And he said, well, I think so too. But I also think we need to sort of check ourselves. So here's how we're going to do that. On the back wall is the name of every student in our school right now. Here, and he handed to his staff those little adhesive stickers. Maybe you got those when you took piano lessons. I did. I got white ones. All of them were white. She had gold stickers. I saw them, but I never got gold stickers. I got white stickers. <laughs> so he handed those, the most, those little stickers to his staff. He said, now go back to the back wall, and any student whose name you recognize, and you know them well enough that you could call them by name if you bumped into them on the street, and, and this is important, and you know something about which that student's passionate, put a star on their name. You know them out of context, and you know something about which they're passionate, put a star on their name. Now this is not Georgetown Middle School, I mean this is not Georgetown, Texas, and it's not the Knoll Middle School, but can any of you guess, maybe I should ask students, can any of you guess what that picture looked like? How many of those names had stars? What do you think? Not too many? About half of the names had stars. And about 25 to 33 percent of the names had bunches of stars. Some kids were known very well in that school. Far too many kids were not known very well at all. And that's not to blame that school is not to blame any school. It's not to point blame, again, remember this, it's not to point blame at the school. Either. Because what he was doing in his 
uh, his wisdom and his vision for how they could be was he was offering a new way of thinking. So while that's a great aha moment, the next thing that he did was brilliant, which is he asked for several things. First is he asked for volunteers to meet with him uh, on a, a, week, a monthly basis for the next several months to look at the kids who were not achieving the state standard, the kids who were um, frequently uh, absent, the kids who were had multiple failures, and I think there was a fourth variable that I can't remember. And being a bright people that you are in this room, what do you suppose the correlation was between the kids with no stars and the kids on all those lists? So they set some things in motion to make a difference in that middle school. The last thing I'll share with you about, I've got lots more I can tell you about this, uh, but the last one I'll share with you is that the other thing he did is he asked his staff to go back to that wall and take at least two names. Every person in that building was expected to take two names of kids with no stars. Their job in the next week was to get to know that kid. Find out who little Timmy is. Find out what makes him tick, what he's excited about. Something he's passionate about. And then every week or two, at the most, you find an excuse to check in with him. Call him by name, and get to know who he is and what he's about, and connect him to the school. So that's another example um, of how this information is applied in different kinds of contexts to make a difference about how we are about working with our young. Okay, so um, at this point, I've asked you to be thinking as we look at this information about someone who was an influencer in your own life. Um, Samantha's going to offer us a little bit of a reflection opportunity about that before we go on. So, Samantha. I would like each of you right now to turn to someone you're sitting next to and tell them who influenced you in your life and what developmental asset they gave you.
was a farmer and I worked on a farm with him and helped him out and he helped to teach me a good work ethic and how to be responsible and how to do, um, how to always work hard and enjoy what you're doing. So. Uh, yep. Uh, my Uncle Walt, and I was just saying, I don't know why, but he used to, we used to do stuff together, you know, go out in the woods, do work on cars, whatever it was. I don't know what assets, but it was just fun to be around. He's a good guy. Go ahead, Amber. Um, I want to say, like, not only my mom, but I have my, we're closer to my mom's side of the family, than the and I want to say my uh, Uncle Bobby, uh, no matter what I'm doing, he's always there telling me whether I'm right or wrong, no matter what. I know he's <coughs> put me down my street path and I know where to go in life. Anyone else? Don't be afraid. Shout out your asset builder. <laughs> my mother and father. I'm from a generation where you listen to your mother and dad. Okay? Uh, it didn't a lot of good. I'm very good today. I do very well. I'm financially sound, but I also have good education. Because I had a mother and father who strictly let me know what life was all about. They never did nothing from me at all. I can talk to children about anything. And they knew my friends better than I did. They knew the kids that were good. They knew the kids that were bad. As my mother and father always say, I might not always be right, but I will always be your mom and dad. And I'm the one, if something happens to you, I might have to give you a, like a kidney, so you better listen to what <laughs> years 
four zero, 40 years of teaching. He was teaching when I called him, he retired about a year later. Um, and he said, you know, I still love it. He was teaching middle school students. He loved working with middle school students. So he had a passion and a drive, but he also cared deeply about getting to know his students and who they were. So those people need to know. And if they're not around for you to tell, then I think our job, I never got the chance to do that same thing with my Uncle Herb that I told you about earlier. And so I think my responsibility is to pass that along to other people. So whether you have the opportunity or not, I think that's a piece of what we're left with in terms of that information. All right, I have a few more details about the, uh, the data to talk with you about. Um, and then we're going to talk with the students some more about their experience with the data it's themselves uh, last Friday. Um, but let's first of all start to take a look at some more of the information. Um, now, some of these data points I'm going to share with you, you have in your possession in that executive summary. Um, so this is from pages 1.5 and 1.6 of that. Other data I'm going to show you in a little bit comes from the, the complete report. There's over 80 pages in the full report. There's lots and lots of data. We're not, no way going to try to uh, do that justice tonight. We're getting your feet wet in it. But know that there will be opportunity for you to engage in more conversation about the data, to think about it more deeply, and to set action plans in place, whether that's a personal plan or an organizational plan or a community plan. Um, so one of the things that the, the research scientists, do you think, if you want to like see these, you can come out here. Sorry, I didn't realize that that's really difficult for you. Unless you're visiting the show sharp, you can read it from the screen up back. Um, our research scientists tell us that if there's five percentage points or more difference between data points, um, that that's notable. Not significant, because that's a scientific term that means something completely different to them. Uh, so they won't let us use that word. But it's worth paying attention to if it's 5% or more. That's true in 6 of the 40 assets for males and 19 of the 40 assets for females. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about this right now, uh, but I will tell you that uh, for the males, it's caring neighborhood, safety, high expectations, personal power, sense of esteem, self-esteem, sorry, self-esteem, and sense of purpose. Those are the six for young, young men in this community are five percentage points or more higher than young women. Of the 19 asset or assets that young women report at higher levels, 15 of them are in the internal categories. The second set we looked at, those things in here, how they are feeling about themselves, their own skills and abilities and values. And yet, you might have noticed that they did not come out ahead in terms of personal power, or sense of purpose. Now I know we're, we're casting averages across here, so I know that's not true of every young woman that's in our presence tonight or in your community. But when we look at that as a whole, I think it does say something about the gender differences that exist in our culture, and, what, and, and I guess we have the opportunity to say, I'm cool with that, and let's just keep going, or we have the chance to pause at moments like this and say, I don't like the way that feels. Now what you do about that in Wolcott compared to what somebody in Kenny Bunk or Kenny Bunkport does or what we do in Standish may, may be entirely different. I don't have the answer to that. You have the answer to that. So our job tonight, I think, is to let you know, give you the snapshot about what we see evidently being true among your young people, to empower them to be have an a role in helping to think about this and where we go, and to encourage, challenge, and invite you to be a part of that answer, too. Um, uh, one other little bit about this is that the largest, uh, the most significant difference on the male side was in safety, with a difference of 19 percentage points, and that is the largest difference in the external assets, if you look between the two. That's not uncommon in communities, by the way, that young men feel more safe than young women, which is another commentary about something probably that we need to address. Um, on the, on the Young women's side, the asset with the biggest difference was interpersonal competence. They, how they feel about their skill to get along with others. Um, and that was a 26 percentage point difference uh, than the average for the young men. And three of the four, oh no, that, never mind, let me let that go. So those are just, those are some insights that from a, a looking at that data that 
think are things worth noting, worth paying attention to, worth thinking about where you might go with that. Um, this is another graphic that you have in your executive summary on uh, page 18. It's the distribution. Now, there's 40 things that we talk about, 40 assets that we mentioned, and we just looked at on those lists. Um, and so we divide those into quartiles. Some young people in your community have, are lucky enough to fall here to have over 31 of them, 31 to 40 of the developmental assets in their lives. 12% of the young people fall there. 37% um, have the 21 to 30. 39% um, have this second category of 11 to 20, and 11% with 10 or fewer. That's going to matter to us a lot as we look at some more data in a little bit about what, how many of these have accumulated in their life. I wasn't around for the discussion at Search Institute where they decided to call these things developmental assets. And sometimes you have people who talk to us about, you know, that's kind of clunky language. Could you, you know, could you call it something a little neater, a little cleaner, a little simpler? Um, and maybe we could have. Um, I know the people who did this work, though, and I know that they are very thoughtful. So I know a lot of time went into this, a lot of committee work and all that went into making that decision. But in this vein, the choice of the word assets, I think, is particularly relevant. Because just like you might be working in a job to put some money away to build some assets toward when you might need that on a rainy day or when something doesn't go well, that's what I think these things are like in the lives of our young. And that is that we have the opportunity to make installments. And if we do that regularly and with intention, and we do it in multiple arenas of a young person's life so that they start to gather those up and have them at their disposal when times get tough, when things go bad, that happens in life periodically, they've got this bank of assets to draw from. As I said, what's really critical is that we try to reach these highest levels. It's particularly important, our research has shown, to move beyond 10. Very strong predictive of young people being more than 10 in terms of how how protective that is in terms of their engaging in, in extreme risk-taking behaviors in their life. Now, interestingly, you are uh, split right down the center. 50% of your young people have more than half. 50% are, from the way they answer questions on our survey, would seem to have less than half. And again, I would tell you, well, that's probably not the picture you would love to see. You'd probably love to see this be more of like you know, a 70-some here instead of a 1. You know, that might be what you'd really love to see. I have to tell you that the fact that that's a 50-50 split is a pretty good thing, actually. In all of, now, I don't see every community report, so I'm not trying to pull this out of my hat and make it more than it is. But I've seen a lot of community reports in the years I've spent with the Institute. Three of the many that I've seen have the young people been at 50% or more. One main community I was in was slightly more than 50%. So, you know, you're on the right track, folks, I think, in terms of what, you, what, you're, what you're transferring to the young people and what they're experiencing in your community. Definitely there are things we can do to, you know, to, to move the needle and make that even better than it is currently. But I think that is worth noting and celebrating. Now, uh, I want to get to the questions with the students, so I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. But on your, whoops, Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm going to take a little bit. Uh, so, my gosh, it's not gorgeous. Okay, so on 110 of your executive summary, you'll see this bar chart. And by the way, Search Institute is a research organization, so it's required that we show multiple forms of charts. So, did you notice? Pie chart? Bar chart. Job is done here, I can go home. Okay, so. There are eight thriving indicators that we track in our survey, and they're listed on that page 10 for you. And so you get an idea of what the kinds of things are we're talking about, leadership, maintaining your health, those kinds of things. Um, and you'll notice that this is the students with 10 or fewer of the 40 assets in their lives. They report on average a little less than three of those eight healthy behaviors, those thriving indicators. These kids, with 31 or more, report six of those healthy behavior, regularly a part of their life. So on the positive side, this is the, the evidence we have that says that as assets accumulate, positive behaviors, thriving behaviors, are more likely to be a part of the young person's life. 
researcher from, the, from Penn State told us this is, this is stronger evidence than he's seen in any of the typical things we track in young people's lives. It overshadows things like social economics. It overshadows things like what community or neighborhood a kid comes from, from their background, level of education of their parents, those kinds of things. This, this is far more predictive of good outcomes than those things are that we tend to look at in our culture. Some examples from your full report. Um, this is a table in the full report that you don't have, but it just pulls out some specific uh, thriving behavior. So in terms of exhibiting leadership, it looks like that. See it grows as the assets grow, as the assets accumulate. Maintaining your health, look at that difference. Maintaining health well, which has lots of financial implications in terms of health and well-being, uh, visits to, um, to medical care, those kinds of things. 94% of those are the kids with highest asset levels reporting that they need health well. Value and diversity, dramatic difference again getting along in this diverse world we live in. Succeeding in school, and i got to stop right here and say those, all of those numbers look terrible, but it's because we use a very high bar. So one thing I'll tell you is that we know that young people tend to self-report their grades pretty accurately. Research has shown that kids do given the opportunity and they feel safe in the situation in which they take the instrument, the survey, that they'll report their uh, grades pretty accurately. We ask about the grades they earn, but our threshold for succeeding in school um, is identified on your document. Oh, yes, if you have the, do they have the asset approach? Uh, it was outside by the cookies. Okay, so there's a there's a document out by the cookies. Uh, it's called the asset approach. It's about eight pages, a little booklet about our information. The definition is on there, but I'll share it with you. It gets mostly A's on that report. How many people in this room think that's the dead-on, spot-perfect definition of success in school? Yeah, not me either. My hand went up just a model. It's not because I think it is. If we had the time to ask a lot more questions and really and, and learn more about students, we could find out we could have a much more robust definition. But it's something. It's what our researchers call a proxy. It gives us something we can look at and say, well, that's one thing. Let's use that. And again, we know kids report it pretty accurately. So, my guess is if we had the time to get really into it, that we would find that this number for those kids with 31 or more assets would be much higher, and that this, all of these numbers might be different if we had these other definitions. But I also put money on the rest of the patterns we just looked at and all the evidence we've seen, is that this trajectory, this increase with more assets, would still be there too. Okay, so we can argue all night if we want to about whether that's a good definition or not. I'm going to tell you, I don't, I think, it isn't the best definition ever of school success. But it does give us an idea about the fact that kids, whatever we use for that bar, would probably do that better with more assets in their lives. Now that's one side of the coin. It's an important side of the coin to us, and that's how kids do better at good things. That's a fairly new way of looking at young people, actually, about thriving. There's not really a good definition even for thriving in our culture. What we know a lot about is this. We know a lot about risk taking. We've studied that for years. And we've got reams of data. I'll bet the superintendent's office has got reams of the surveys that have tracked risks among your students. We look at that too, but it's the bounds of the two that I really want you to remember. Don't forget about the ones we just looked at about thriving. But we do ask about thriving, I mean, uh, risk taking behaviors as well. Anybody remember how many thriving things I said we looked at? Eight. What's the number here for risk taking? 24. So evidence that our culture, I think, tracks this in a very different way than we track thriving. But we track it, and it's important. So let's look at those patterns. Overall, and this is in your executive summary on page 11, those kids with the fewest assets, now you notice the slant of the bar graphs going the other way, which tells you that those kids with the lowest number of assets, 10 or fewer, have the highest number of risk behaviors regularly in their life. Right about now is usually when one of these young people up here will raise their hand and go, excuse me, sir, you're kidding me, right? You've had to survey, what, three million of us now to figure this out next time? Tell you what, just come to school, buy my friends and I a soda, we'll sit down, a couple minutes, we'll square you right away. <laughs> this is a lot about common sense, folks, but it packages it in a way that really we can look at and say, okay, this is rooted in science, it makes sense to us, 
my guess is if you work in an organization in this community that works with kids that don't have a lot of opportunity to experience assets, you're not surprised they're engaged in more risk-taking behavior. Um, so as community, this is something, though, we can do something about. We can make a change in these patterns. So some specifics, again, from your full report. Um, in terms of problem alcohol use, 36% of those at the lowest level of assets report that, only 2% at the highest. Acts of violence, a little editorial moment, so I'll get up on my soapbox here to say even that number is too high. It's about twice any of the rest of the risk-taking behaviors we have. Even in our most asset-abundant kids, they report at least twice as the level of violence in their life um, from other risk-taking patterns. So for me, this has always been a wake-up call about what we're doing in our culture about that issue. Like, there you go, from 45 down to 5. Um, illicit drug use, look at that plummet. And maybe one more. Too early sexual activity. So there is this protective factor. It promotes thriving, it protects from risk taking. Um, that combination is the real crux of this information, and it's what we see as being the really important um, portion of this information. And it's why we believe that our jobs and communities should be about helping to increase the asset profile of every young person we have an opportunity to be around. And whether that's the young person with hair color you would never dream of having that's bagging your groceries, or whether it's your own son or daughter, or a neighbor kid, um, all of those young people need us to be attentive to these things in their life. Um, I think we're at the point where I want to take a moment to remind us that um, we had, the young people here had the opportunity to sit with this data on last Friday for a day. Were they right in this very space? Yes, but yes. the divider was open with oh, the whole, whole lot of time to play. All right. So um, they spent time looking at the data, making sense of it for themselves. They used the executive summary that you have in the front of you. Um, and so we're going to provide an opportunity for um, questions 